Okay, so um, last time we ended our lesson by introducing the concept of uh, stochastic integral and stochastic uh, differential. Before that, we introduced a generalization of the M2 class that we called the H2 class, in which we have seen that we essentially uh, take on some of the assumptions and make them weaker just to have a more general set than that works for us. It can be further generalized by, for example, limiting the interest to specific subintervals, taking local properties, but these are things that we are not interested in at, at this stage. If needed, we will introduce that later. Now, what I want to uh, to present briefly, because it could be itself the topic of a course, is the, the Eto Dublin formula that we will use to solve some of the stochastic processes that we will use as tools to model the prices, the returns of the assets. We will do that, you will see very heuristically, so we just state the theorem and see an application in the lecture notes, you find some little more details, for example, in giving an interpretation of the Ito formula as a sort. A sort, so quotation marks are important, as a sort of Taylor expansion series, but it's nothing more than the stochastic counterpart of the Chin rule, if you want. Now, proving the Ito Dublin formula properly would take quite some time, also because we would have to play with convergence of random variables, introduce further, further topics. What we do is just considering what we, what we are uh, interested in and what we will use, actually. If you are really keen on knowing the, the proof, you find it in many stochastic books, and it's for sure covered in the SD in the SD course. And if read and shrieve or whatever you want, you have questions about the proof, I'm more than happy to uh, to discuss with you in my uh, in my office when you want. Uh, now the Eta Dublin formula is useful because you will see immediately how it allows us to solve uh, problems that otherwise could still be solved. If you remember the exercise I gave uh, last time this is the long way of solving this type of process. You can do that, but it really takes ages, depending on the process. And, and we don't want to do that. Now, the, the theorem, which is theorem three in our lecture notes, um, I just copied it to be precise, is the following. So let's consider xt to be a stochastic integral. So it's a stochastic process and blah, blah, blah that we have defined with differential dx t equal to u t omega dt plus v t omega v b t omega. So if you want it just to be, since I'm putting everywhere omega, let's put that also here. So t omega, but then we, we're removing omega immediately. With u and v in the h2 class on the time horizon 0t. You will see in a minute that after this we introduce finally the financial part of the course and the time horizon becomes fundamental. And for what concerns u, we also have the additional condition that the integral 0t of u s omega being finite, but yes, yes, being finite is equal to one. 
which is an integrability condition that we need because at the end of the day, when we play with this type of processes, as I told you, we want to be able to compute the, the different moments. And it will be clearer later that this condition becomes necessary for specific processes. So let G T um, X be a function that maps from zero plus infinity product R to R. So let G be a function such that the first derivative with respect to t, to time, the first derivative with respect to x, and the second derivative with respect to x exist and are continuous. For example, continuity is very important in the form of proof of the, of the lemma. The process y t omega defined as g of t x t omega is still a stochastic process uh, so, sorry, stochastic integral, for sure it's stochastic process, but it's a stochastic integral with, and that's the important part for us, the following stochastic differential. So d y t is equal to g prime x of t x t dt plus G prime G prime T, not G prime X, G prime T, G prime X, T, X, T, D, X, T, plus 1 over 2 G second in X, T, X, T, and then we have X, T squared. So if you want, in a sense, you can actually see that as an expansion, and you find more details in the in the lecture notes, in which for what concerns time, we just stop at a first order, and for what concerns the rest, we stop at the second order. Is this something? that comes out of the fact that we decided to stop at these uh, different orders, yes and no. So it comes out from the form of proof that actually a lot of terms disappear. And I will try to convince you that this is actually, this is actually the case. And everything, all the things that disappear, essentially disappear because of the property of the objects we are playing with. Remember that we are in the usual framework we are starting with, uh, that is to say, we have this time interval 0t that we split in this partition whose mesh is vanishing in the number of elements in the partition, so it's vanishing, and we are playing with the Brownian motion. So we know that it is a uh, if we consider the increment of a random motion is a normal distributed random variable with mean zero and variance equal to the increment in time. So between t and t plus one, it would be t plus one minus t. Uh, um, now, let's immediately consider uh, an application of this formula that is useful for us for the rest of the course. But it's also 
uh, interesting because it allows already to discuss some of the of the properties of this form. By the way, the big complication, if you want, without being particularly technical, the big complication here is every time to find the function g that we can use to solve the, the problem that we want to, to tackle. Sometimes it's evident, as in the case that I will show you. Other times, it's not that evident. And obviously, we have to uh, to play with classes of classes of solution. In this course, we will just use three possibilities, but there are uh, many more. Okay, so I will bother you definitely more with this process in the rest of the course. But let's introduce the so-called geometric random motion. Now. Later in the course, I will try to convince you that, for sure, this is not the most sophisticated process that we can use to model the price of an asset. But empirically speaking, it has very nice properties. It can be tested on data, which is fundamental. Because I remember at the, day, at the end of the day, here, we are not very much interested in the data, because we are doing everything from a theoretical point of view. But at a certain point, you have to estimate the parameters. So the fact that you can actually estimate the parameters is rather fundamental. So it's pivotal for the analysis. And the, general, uh, the geometric brand motion allows for that. It also has a behavior in the, in the increments that is more appropriate than the standard brand motion. But these are all things we will see at due time. What we know of the geometric brand motion is that it is defined in this way. So, let ST be the price of an asset, okay, the time T. The geometric ground motion states that DST is equal to mu ST dt plus sigma ST dbt. Where you will see that, uh, okay, BT is our ground motion, ST is our price process, mu is the so-called drift of our price process, it's easy to see that if you take the expectation of a quantity like that, mu will play the big role in defining what is the expected value. We will see that great part of our course, when we play with this object, is to get rid of mu. And to get rid means substituting mu with something else. That will be the risk-free rate, for example. And mu can be whatever, in principle, it's real, so let's assume it's positive. Uh, for what we consider, for what concerns sigma, it's the diffusion part, and obviously accounts for the variability part. So it, it enters very importantly also in the expectation, but then it governs the variability of the process, and it's the diffusion parameter is we will assume to be positive. Okay, stop for the moment. We don't care too much. Now, the first thing is that we want to find a solution for this type of stochastic uh, differential. Now, in this situation, it's not particularly difficult because the first thing that we could do is to take the S term here and take it on the left hand side. If I do that, I can just rewrite this in this way. Okay? And what I can immediately observe is that this quantity here, dst over st, reminds me of what? Of the differential log, or the log derivative, as you want to, as you want to call it. So if you want, I can take as function g here the log. And in which sense I can take my function g that needs to be a function in t and x to be just the log of x. If this is the case, what do we know? If we take the derivative with respect to time of g, g does not directly depend on time. 
So what's this derivative? It is zero. If I take, and the trick with these functions is always to find out functions that allow for very simple derivatives. If I take the first derivative with respect to x, this is equal to one over x, good. And if I take the second derivative with respect to x, it is? Yeah, correct. Good. You know the derivatives. Good. So these are our terms. And why do we need them? Because then we need to plug them there. Okay? Okay, so we have these ingredients. So let's try to use our formula here to solve our problem. Okay, so our function is the function log of x. So if we rewrite there, it means that we are considering d log of st, okay, equal to the derivative in t of our object. So that would be the log <laughs> of st with respect to time. But this object, the function log of st, does not depend directly on time. I agree that time is in the process, but it's not directly depending on time. So it is zero. So the first term here, it's what? It is zero dt. Okay? It will obviously disappear. Plus, I have the first derivative in x, and the first derivative in x is 1 over x. For us, x is st, so it means that it is 1 over st. And this quantity multiplies dxt. Okay? So dxt is dst for us. Okay? So what do we do? We just copy that quantity. So it's mu st dt plus sigma st dbt. Okay? I'll leave it there for the moment. Plus, it's 1 over 2, the second derivative, times the square of dx. Okay? So 1 over 2, the second derivative is minus 1 over x squared. So allow me to change immediately here. It's minus 1 over 2st squared. That multiplies what? dxt squared. So I just copy that, and for the moment I leave it as it is. dt plus sigma st db squared. Okay, so 0t, we ignore it. Now what we can do, we can just multiply by st and it becomes mu dt plus sigma dbt. Okay? And for what concerns the second, the second element, what we have to do is to essentially expand the power. And if we do that, it's minus 1 over 2 sigma t squared. And inside the bracket, what do we have? We have mu squared s t squared d t squared plus sigma squared s t squared d b t squared plus two times what? Mu sigma mu sigma s t squared d t d b. Okay? Fine. Now, here we see the intuition 
of the fact, and then in the lecture notes I repeat, you find a little bit more detail, the intuition of the fact that justifies these, that is to say stop them at the first order for T and at the second order for, for X or for ST. And it comes from the form. We are playing with infinitesimal quantities, so dt is a very, very small interval, okay? So what happens if we take dt squared? It vanishes to zero very quickly, okay? So if you want, you can say that this guy tends to zero. What about this guy here, last one, two times mu sigma, blah, blah, blah. We have dt times db. Now, dt is infinitesimal and small. db is what? Is a random variable with mean zero and variance equal to dt. Okay? So you are multiplying a very small quantity, dt, with respect to a random variable, which is centered in zero and with a variance which is dt itself. So it's another, if you want, second order term in dt, and also that one goes to zero very quickly. And now we have the last part, which is actually the most important part. We have sigma squared, st squared, dbt squared. But here, dbt squared, is the exact situation in which we end up using the eta isometry. Because dBt squared, when you have the Brownian motion squared, or if you want, you, also, you can also link it to the quadratic variation. Just uh, at the end of the day, you end up with the same type of reasoning. But what happens is that, what is this quantity here? This quantity here is so what happens? This guy here, we ignore it. This guy here, we ignore it, okay? Remember that we are just having a heuristical view. It's still working, but it's okay, obviously heuristical. This part here, we cope it. Minus. 1 over 2, st squared and st squared just cancel themselves. And we have sigma squared uh, dt. So it means that I can, for example, collect the dt terms. It means that we have mu minus sigma squared over 2 dt plus sigma dbt. What we can do now, exploiting what we have seen so far in terms of eta integration and so on, is to finally get rid of the d part. So I can just take integration, and what I have is that the log of st is equal to is equal to mu minus sigma squared over 2d plus sigma bt. And then I just take what? I can take the exponential on both sides, and by exponentiating, what do I have? I have that st is equal to, oh, sorry, sorry. Stop me when I write something stupid. Okay, it's the same, I can have it here. There is some, obviously, log of s0. So what happens if I exponentiate? I end up with a solution of the type st is equal to s0 that multiplies the exponential of this object here. So it will be mu minus sigma squared over 2t plus sigma bt. That would be our solution of the geometric Brownian motion. It will be extremely important because it has many nice properties. For example, what do I know about this guy here? It's a Brownian motion, so bt is a Brownian motion. What's the distribution of bt? 
this normal distribution. Very good. What happens if I take the exponential of a normal? What distribution do I get? A log normal. The log normal is the exponentiation of a, of a normal, or the log of the variable is a normal. So I immediately know that in geometric variable motion, the prices are log normally distributed. Okay? And we will see immediately that this is extremely useful in terms of asymmetries and blah, blah, blah. So what we have just to recall in this setting is that there are dt squared terms in the way we prefer to write them, they vanish because of, because of our setting. So we end up with this way of solving our, uh, our stochastic processes. Okay, so in the rest of the course, my interest for the ETO, the Bloom formula, even if I respect it a lot in terms of theoretical beautiful result, is just the practical application of the formula. So to be able to compute the, the different quantities. Otherwise, that would be a course on ETO and uh, it will be uh, too much. Okay, so this is the ETO setting so far that we need to finally tackle the financial part of the course. We will see that this type of machinery will be fundamental immediately when we try to get rid of the drift, when we try to price the different financial assets that we aim to price in this course. As we did for the ETO part, we have to have a little flashback and go back to the basics of the financial part of the course. So to the basic quantities that we need in order to be financial mathematicians. And as I will try to stress a lot, these are quantities that are simple, but these are also extremely tricky. Because what I hope I will be able to stress is that all the simple quantities we are now introducing have very profound implications. Okay, so let's consider our financial framework. We will now play with a market. In order to play with the quantities on the market that are, we will see, mainly random quantities, we need the proper machinery. And for us, the machinery will be the probability space omega f p. The measure p here, from now on will be called the physical or the market measure. What is the physical measure? What is the market measure? It's the probability measure that governs randomness on the market and that in principle is something that we can study by looking at the quantities on the market. So prosaically speaking, we can collect data and we can use the data to make inference about the probabilities, okay? So it's really the measure linked to the market as we observe it. One thing that we will say at the end of this class, if not at the early beginning of the next one, is that we are not satisfied with this quantity. Why? Because you may have whatever type of interpretation of probability you like. You can be a frequentist, you can be a subjectivist, you can be a logicist, whatever you want. Yet, it's not difficult to understand that this quantity here is very dependent on our access to the market. So if you don't have full access to the, to the data, if you have your strange beliefs because you believe that something strange might, might happen, if you combine both things. If you have your risk aversion, which is different from the risk affinity of another agent, it will be very difficult to share the same ideas about the probabilities. And the big aim, and the big goal of financial mathematics is to get rid of this problem by substituting P with another measure. That would be the risk neutral measure. That would be the benchmark on which everyone agrees that we can use to make all our uh, interpretations and speculations. 
Okay, but for the moment, this is our market, market measure. Fine. Assume now that on the market there are a certain number of assets so that are these goods that we trade, and these are financial assets, for K from 1 to capital K. Okay? So AK is asset K, and we have a certain number of assets, capital K. For every asset with S, T, A, K, Omega, and then I promise that at a certain point I will drop all these kind of things, we identify the price of asset A, K at time T under the scenario Omega. So it's a random quantity. It depends on the scenario Omega, which is part of large or capital Omega, and time t for the asset AK. Now, if you are investing on a market, it can be the case that you have all your money invested in just one asset. Then obviously you are dealing with concentration risk and all those kind of problems. But most of the time, you hold a portfolio. A portfolio is what? Is a combination of different assets. If you have a portfolio of assets, it means that you have a box in which you have different quantities of your assets. So if you go and buy vegetables and fruit, you will have three apples, two oranges, seven bananas, and whatever you want. That's the same with assets. So what we have to introduce is the concept of shares. With theta, T, A, K, Omega, we indicate the amount of shares, the, the amount of units of asset AK that we have in our portfolio. This quantity, very important, can lie between minus infinity and plus infinity. It's not necessarily a finite quantity. There are results in financial mathematics that require some of these quantities to be not finite. It will not be our case. You would see that immediately we will restrict to the situations in which the shares are finite quantities. But in general, they can be between minus infinity and plus infinity. So they can be positive and negative. So what's the meaning of the sign then? If something is positive, it is in our portfolio because we bought it. So we have a long position in it. If it's negative, is in our portfolio, but we sold it. So we are short in it. So at a certain point, we will have to pay something, do something about that position. It can be positive and negative. If a portfolio is made of a combination of assets whose shares are all finite, so if we take a combination of assets and the, the amount of units of different assets we have are finite, we call the portfolio bounded. It's a bounded portfolio. Um, it's not difficult to observe. It's also a nice exercise, if you want to think about that, that if I consider a market in which I can have only a finite number of scenarios, then necessarily all portfolios need to be bounded. So if I have a finite number of scenarios, we get this nice property in terms of shares. They need to be bounded. Now, one thing that I want to stress a lot, and that sometimes is not clear, so I really want to stress that a lot, is that I know that my notation, and then later I will simplify it, can be pedantic because we have theta, a, k, t, omega. That is not just because I want to be sadistic in terms of notation. It's just to recall that the share is a random process. It's possibly a random process. It can also be deterministic. I'm not saying that it cannot. But it's possibly a random process. And in fact, we will require something very important for this process. This process needs to be adapted to the natural filtration
filtration generated by the price process. <coughs> Also here, notice that we require adaptivity to be with respect to the price process. Then I agree that in 98% of the situations we will consider that would be the natural filtration generated by the Brownian motion. Because if I take a geometric Brownian motion, all the uncertainty comes from the Brownian motion. So if, even if the price follows a geometric Brownian motion, at the end of the day, adaptivity is with respect to the simple standard Brownian motion that is within the geometric Brownian motion. But in general, we require adaptivity with respect to the natural filtration generated by the price process. So the shear process A, uh, sorry, theta, T, A, K, omega needs to be adapted to the price flow of the filtration generated by the corresponding price process. and not necessarily to the price process of another asset. Which is another interesting thing that we will see in, in due time. Now, the last thing that I want to stress about the shear process is the meaning. Now, in continuous time, that would be in general the situation in which we in which we play, uh, it's probably a little bit more difficult to see that. So let's, for a moment, consider the discrete time situation. What is theta, T, A, K, omega? This is the amount of shares I own. And when I say I own, if it is negative, I'm shorting the position. But we understand each other. So it's the amount of shares I own in the time interval t, t plus 1. OK? So it's what I have in my infinitesimal, if we consider them continuous time, it's the amount I have until I change, because I want to change the shear process, or because there are some conditions that manifest themselves and automatically change the shear process. But it is in this way. And that will be important to recall later. A definition that we can give about the portfolio, there are many definitions. And a couple of them are fundamental, because they are really the roots of financial mathematics or mathematical finance. In this case, there is still no difference between the two subjects. And it's the, it's the following. A portfolio is bounded if all the different shares processes are essentially finite quantities of, over time, they give finite quantities of, over time. But a more important con concept is, one, is the one of dynamically rebalanced portfolio. What is a dynamically rebalanced portfolio? Is a portfolio on which we intervene by changing the composition of the portfolio by buying and selling assets in order to reach our goal. That can be to maximize our return, that can be to minimize the losses, that can be a max min or min max process, uh, principle, whatever. So if we intervene on the portfolio and we rebalance the portfolio, that is to say changing, for example, the amount of shares that we have, I'm selling something and after a certain amount of periods I buy it back, okay? So I'm intervening. This is a dynamically rebalanced uh, portfolio. And it's very important because in the rest of the course, we will play with a specific subtype of dynamically rebalanced portfolios that are fundamental in all the results that we would see up to Black and Schultz. So the fact that we need dynamically uh, rebalanced uh, portfolios. Now, if this is the setting, and then we stop for the break.
what's the value at time t of our portfolio? Now, the value at time t of our portfolio that we indicate with b, t, theta in principle in bold because it's a vector of shear processes. And in any case, when we build a portfolio, we will always assume that our portfolio contains all the assets on the market. Technically speaking, if this is not true, we are just assuming that the share process is equal to zero. It's not present just because the share process is equal to zero. So our portfolio time t is equal to what? Is just the sum for k from one to capital K of the assets that we have, and we multiply the amount of shares that we have for the corresponding prices. Okay, so the value of our portfolio for the different assets will be theta p a k omega times s t a k omega. That's the value a time t of our portfolio. Of all these assets, there is only one asset that is a little bit particular and that we take out of this standard uh, representation, which is the risk-free asset. What is the risk-free asset? You can think of the risk-free asset as a money account, as a bank account, or as a zero coupon bond that has no risk in it. It means that if I call R the, the risk-free asset, the expectation of R is equal to a constant R. So if you want this. And oh, the other moments. So if I take, for example, the variance, it is zero. It's a constant. So there is no risk because there is no randomness involved. If I take 10, 10 euros and I put my 10 euros in my risk-free bank account, at the end of the period, I will get 10 euros and the corresponding interest. In most of this course, we will discuss the situation in which this quantity is non-negative. We know that in reality, this is not the case at the moment. There are essentially different countries in which this is negative. And we will also discuss that. It has very important implications in terms of our theory. Summarizing what I will tell you holds for sure in this situation, if we introduce this and we do not introduce modifications in the theory, you can take my lecture notes, set them on fire, and do whatever you want.